Hello, everyone, and welcome to XSTEM All Access. My name is Justin Schaefer, also known as Mr. Fascinate, and I'm excited to be back as your host for this multi-day series filled with STEM inspiration. Today is the first day of four exciting new XSTEM episodes brought to you by the USA Science and Engineering Festival. The mission of the USA Science and Engineering Festival is to inspire the next generation to pursue careers in STEM. That's science, technology, engineering, and mathematic careers, which is also super important to me as we see STEM as a tool that can be used to empower people to create the careers that they want for themselves. You can check out their other free programs and events for teachers and students at usasciencefestival.org. Before we begin, please join me in thanking our partners at AstraZeneca, the U.S. Air Force, and the U.S. Department of Defense, DOD STEM, for making this XSTEM series possible. We'll be hearing from each of these organizations over the next few days. I hope you're ready to be inspired and have some fun with me and an amazing group of STEM role models. Over the next four days, we'll hear from engineers, marine biologists, aviators, neuroscientists, and more. We'll get out of our seats and dance to some STEM tunes. And you'll wanna keep your phones close by for virtual selfies. And we'll be answering your previously submitted questions during the program. But don't worry, if you have more questions during the program, send them to us using the form at usasciencefestival.org and we'll get answers to you after the program. I hope you are as excited as I am to get started. Before we jump in, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Justin Schaefer. I also go by Mr. Fascinate. I traveled all over the world pre-COVID and excited young people just like you all about STEM. I've hosted science TV shows. I've created the STEM Success Summit, which is a virtual event for college students. And I'm working on a number of different projects to excite young people about the next generation of STEM careers. So I'm super aligned with the mission of the USA Science and Engineering Festival. I'm coming to you from New York City today, but the entire globe is represented in our audience. We have attendees from California, New York, Washington DC, Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Ohio, Rhode Island, just to name a few, there's a whole bunch more. And from outside of the US, we got Mexico, Egypt, India, Thailand, South Africa, and France. And I wanna give a huge warm STEM welcome to everyone. Wherever you're joining us from today, make sure you also show us how you STEM and participate in our activity on social media. Tag us at USA Science Fest and me at Mr. Fascinate and use the hashtag to show us how you STEM. You can share your science projects, show us how you explore nature, and how you are becoming an ambassador for our planet and beyond. Grab your phone and take a selfie while tuning in today. Speaking of selfies, there will be an opportunity for a virtual selfie with me and our guests during today's program. So have your camera on standby. Don't forget to share and tag us and show us how you STEM. Now, let's get started with today's program. Our theme today is combining STEM superpowers, and we have two actual superhero scientists joining us. First, we'll hear from Dr. Tracy Fenera. She's an ocean scientist and environmental engineer who is making a serious impact on the health of our planet. We'll also hear from the chemical and biomolecular engineer, Tamara Robertson, who is on a mission to inspire individuals, especially young women, to pursue STEM careers. In addition to being engineers, both of these women are passionate science communicators who share their love of STEM with the public. You may have seen Tracy on the Weather Channel, Mythbusters, The Search, Weird Earth, or CBS Mission Unstoppable. And Tamara is one of the leading hosts on the Science Channel for shows such as Sidejinx, Mythbusters 2.0, and Mythbusters Jr. And if that wasn't enough, these two superhero engineers have joined forces to create a comic book series featuring none other than the comic book versions of themselves using real life science to save the world. Let's take a look. We have a big announcement to make. Huge. Are we doing it? Yeah. Oh, so, Seekers of Science! We made a comic! We made a comic! 
Wow, that is awesome. I am so excited to learn more about their comic book series. Let's jump right in for a closer look at these superhero engineers. I'm excited to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Tracy Fenera. Tracy is an environmental engineer and research scientist for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but also known as NOAA. She is on a mission to extend humanity's time on Earth by making it safe for all living things. Her diverse background includes storm chasing, designing aquaponics for wastewater treatment in space, and serving as a science communicator, and so much more. Dr. Tracy Fenera, you're a good friend of mine. I'm so excited to welcome you to our program. Thank you so much for having me. And Justin, it's awesome to see you. You're amazing, and I'm so happy to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Tracy Panara. I am an environmental engineer, which means that I use different scientific disciplines to protect the environment, humans, and wildlife. Looking back on my life, there were two, there were two moments that really directed the path that I'm on right now. And the first one was when I was in fourth grade. I had a teacher tell me about a toxic waste, a toxic waste site that was right down the street from where I grew up. Industries were dumping all of this toxic waste into canals and in waterways, and it was leaching into soil and, and moving. And people started building schools and, and houses, and there were birth defects and cancer clusters. And that's when I realized how everything in this world is connected. What we put into the environment eventually comes back to affect our health. That incident started the EPA Superfund program. It was an incident called Love Canal. The second moment is when I learned that unsafe drinking water was the lead, leading killer among children worldwide. Something that we take for granted by just turning on our faucet. We are so lucky that that seriously is a miracle. And, and this water, water that we need was killing children. And, and I just wanted to do something. I wanted to do something, whether it was papered or not, I just needed to take action. And that's when I realized what true passion was. So I learned about this, this field of study where I can provide clean water and enough food and protect people from natural disasters and build and design things. And, and I was like, sign me up, I wanna be a superhero. And so I became an environmental engineer. After years of designing and storm chasing to collect data and laboratory work. I received my PhD in environmental engineering focused on water. So my first job was to lead a research program at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. My main research was on Florida red tide. The, the species name is Karenia brevis. This is a microscopic algae species that lives in the Gulf of Mexico. What makes the species so unique is that it is toxic. You know, there are thousands of species of phytoplankton and we, over millennia, we can thank them for the amount of oxygen that we have in our atmosphere. But, but some of these species are toxic. So Karenia brevis releases a toxin that harms aquatic life, causes mass wildlife fatalities, dead fish, dolphins, sharks, turtles, manatees, but that toxin can also aerosolize, meaning that it attaches onto particles in the air, moves on shore with winds and causes people to cough and sneeze. And, and for those with asthma or other respiratory illnesses, this can be really serious. So I developed apps and websites to alert the public of where the effects of Florida red tide were so that they can make healthy decisions when going to a beach. And, and if you're down in Florida or traveling on spring break, you can go to visitbeaches.org to see all of the information that's there. So Florida Red Tide, we still have so many questions. And the best thing that we can do for the public is tell them where the blooms are because after 70 years of research, we still don't have all the answers. We have inconsistent data streams, depending on how much money we got to research, we collected data. So, so sometimes it was a lot of data, sometimes it was a little data, but having that go back and forth prevents us from really answering the big questions. And so, so what I started to realize is that we were treating this like a local problem because it does just affect the Southwest part of, of Florida. Well, the Panhandle too, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but, but what it really was, as I started researching and looking further into it, is that this was a global thing. 
these blooms of, of Florida red tide are initiated through ocean currents, hurricanes coming over from, from the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Saharan dust in the atmosphere that deposits in the Gulf of Mexico coming all the way over from Africa. Uh, the, the flow that's coming from 40% of the United States flows down to the Mississippi River and out into the Gulf of Mexico. And some scientists think that that might have something to do with it. And my friends just researched a blue hole, which is a sinkhole from, from thousands of years ago. It's a spring 50 miles off the shore of Florida that might be bringing nutrients that feed this red tide species. So, so we had all these data points, but we weren't making connections because we weren't looking at the world as a whole. We weren't considering all of these earth systems that do work together. Everything in this world is connected. So I took a job with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, to answer these big questions. Right now I'm in charge of the United States modeling efforts for our oceans to better understand how all these systems interact to find out where fish are migrating to, to protect our, our sharks, our, our manatees, our fish populations, but also prevent from uh, flooding, storm surge, protecting people in, in natural disasters and extreme severe weather. So I just started with NOAA in August and already I'm seeing the real potential to, to make a difference in the world. The one thing that I want you to, to take away from this is that we all make an impact. It's a responsibility that you cannot avoid. What you put into the environment eventually comes back to affect your health or the health of future generations. So it's up to you to make a positive impact and be a superhero for the planet. Tracy, that was an awesome dynamic presentation. You spoke about algal blooms, you spoke about red tides, you talk about environmental engineering and your work at NOAA and saving our planet and how all of us have a responsibility to do the same. Thank you so much for those amazing points. Let's go ahead and jump right into our Q&A. We have some audience members that sent in questions before the show, and we have a few students who will be asking their questions in person. So here's our first question from Marie. Hello, my name is Marie. I have a question for Dr. Fenera. I would like to ask how you think your work can inspire younger people to take action for the environment. Thank you. Awesome question, Marie. Tracy, let us know what you think about that. Marie, thank you so much for that question. And that's a great question and something that I'm learning and growing uh, to do better every single day. So my, my goal is to inspire kids to fall in love with the planet, to, to find uh, just such, such awe in, in all of the processes, the plants, the animals, everything that we depend on to survive. Because if you fall in love with the outdoors, with nature, we tend to protect what we love. And it'll just be an innate response to, to be environmentally conscious, to do things to protect our environment and to sustain our natural resources. So, so that's what I do. I try to bring kids to nature, to fall in love with nature. But also, um, I'm running a STEM camp this summer. I, I talk to schools all over the nation about, about my work, about the environment, about the earth. And, and I hope to, to bring more and more kids onto, onto my mission, Inspector Planet, to make the world a better place. And, and you can sign up to be a member on inspectorplanet.com. And we'll send you information on how you can be a steward in your community uh, and for the earth to better protect animals and humans. Awesome job, Tracy. Thank you for that response. Looks like we have another question from a viewer named Claire. Let's hear, let's hear from Claire. My name is Claire. I'm a middle school student from Alexandria, Virginia. My question is for Dr. Tracy Fanara. What type of wildlife do you work with? Hi, Claire. That is a wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking it because working with wildlife is, of course, my favorite part of my job. Uh, so everything from those phytoplankton, which are 
small single cell dinoflagellate, which means that they, they are one cell with a couple tails so they can swim up and down. So Florida red tide is, is the smallest species that I work with. It's microscopic, like 15 to 25 microns, which is super small. But then I also did work with the United States Geologic Survey on, on uh, monarch butterfly populations and, and other pollinators to see how insecticides and herbicides, that stuff that we spray on our lawns, to see how they affect their reproduction and their growth cycles so that we understand what chemicals impact our really important pollinators. And then to go to a little bit bigger of an animal, I work with my conservation friends down in South Florida to actually save alligators. So if an alligator shows up on a pond, which of course they do because it was their land and we keep on building on it. So they, they transfer from one pond to one pond and sometimes those ponds are in residential areas. Well, it's perfectly legal for a trapper to take that alligator and actually uh, turn it into purses. But me and my team, well, actually I'm on their team. Uh, I help them sometimes to actually go and get these gators before other trappers can and bring them to conservation areas so they can live out their life, uh, which is, uh, alligators are the most amazing animal. They all have different personalities. They are, I mean, they have survived thousands of years. They, they were all the way back from the dinosaurs and they're here today because of all their special uh, physiological characteristics that have allowed them to, to survive ice ages and, and heat waves and floods. They're just amazing. And then uh, recently I started um, doing more with shark tagging, actually putting tags on sharks so we can monitor where they're going. And they are going to different places with climate change. We're seeing that their migration patterns are changing. I also do some work with manatees, trying to find out where their populations are. And right now in Northeast Florida, we have quite a crisis on our hands where there's a mass fatality event where hundreds of manatees have died within just a couple of months. But that event was, was a domino effect of things that started back in 2009. Can you believe that? a chain of events, environmental events and, and human impact has resulted in this mass wildlife fatality. So um, I'm working with and talking to my friends that are manatee experts to try to figure out what exactly is going on here. So so many animals and, and they're all cool, and, but my favorite animal, don't tell anybody, but I think it's my dog. He's pretty awesome. <laughs> Well, that was a super comprehensive answer, Tracy. Thank you so much for that. And we all know you love alligators. I just saw a fire photo on your Instagram recently with you swimming with an alligator. So you're pretty bold for that one. Uh, <laughs> but our high school students have uh, another question that you sent in, Dr. Fenera. They ask about the projects that you work on. They say you work on a lot of different projects as an environmental engineer, but which one of those is your favorite? Gosh, that is... That is so, that is such a good question. Thank you so much for asking that question. Uh, and it's a hard one to answer because I, I work on a diverse group of projects because no, no problem can ever be solved through one scientific discipline. So I expose myself to as many scientific disciplines as possible. I think that the, my favorite project right now, besides that, that earth systems model is is a project that I'm working on with NASA to build an aquaponic system for space travel to clean wastewater with, with shellfish, with shrimp and, and mussels and, and uh, snails. We're actually putting them in an aquaponic system with, with a primary treatment of algae uh, that actually clean wastewater. So you might not, you might not like this, but the amount of water that we have today was here a thousand years ago and will be here a thousand years from now. We only have one, one batch of water and only 1% of that is actually drink, drinkable, usable fresh water. So you might have drank the same drop of water that a dinosaur did, which is pretty cool. But at the same time, are you kind of getting my drift? What we put into the environment 
even when we go to the bathroom, ends up being our drinking water source. So, so what we're doing with this aquaponics system is the reality of that. We're having astronauts uh, waste water from going to the bathroom, flushing the toilet, and then that water is going to be treated through our system. And at the end of it, it's not only going to feed some plants, but it's also going to be drinkable water. Uh, it's pretty amazing. It's it's going to be, it really um, breaks the boundaries of science here on earth with a sustainable system and can be used for fish farming and, and a bunch of earth processes. So we're really excited about it. Tracy, that's such a cool project. I personally have worked on aquaponic systems myself, but that one sounds like it's got a lot of applications for space travel and the space age that we're seemingly going into now. So super cool <laughs> stuff. And I think no one's going to forget hearing that explanation today. So thank you for everyone <laughs> who submitted questions so far. That's all the time we have for questions right now. But Tracy will be coming back later on to answer some more questions. So don't go anywhere. And if you have another question for Tracy that we didn't cover today, send them to us now using the form at usasciencefestival.org and we'll get Tracy's answers to you after the program. Tracy, it was an absolute pleasure hearing from you as usual, and we'll see you again at the end of the program. Thank you so much, Justin. Awesome seeing you. Awesome, Tracy. Everyone, please give her a virtual high five, a round of applause, and we'll see her again very shortly. All right, so now I'm excited to introduce and welcome our second speaker, Tamara Robertson. Tamara is an accomplished engineer turned TV host, actor, and superhero scientist. After a decade in corporate engineering, Tamara noted a lack of women in her field. In hopes of inspiring more young women to pursue STEM careers, she transitioned her efforts to outreach and has since become one of the leading female science hosts and engineers on the Science Channel. Tamara, I want to give you an absolutely warm welcome to our program today. Thanks, Justin. It's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Awesome to see you. And I'm looking forward to seeing this presentation that's coming right up. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, as Justin said, I'm Tamara Robertson. I'm a chemical and biomolecular engineer. I spent a... Oh, I have spent a long time in that career now, but we won't age me just yet. Uh, instead, we'll actually back up a little bit um, because one of the things I want you to learn today and to leave with is that where your journey starts doesn't define where it ends, you do. And so just like any other superhero, I have an origin story. Mine's just as quirky as I am, and it has involved a lot of adaptability, a lot of learning and failing and a lot of iterating and all of those are important aspects when you look at engineering and science as a whole because it's those of us that can adapt and those of us that can iterate and evolve that are going to be able to get further in life so i started my journey on this world as a kid to two military parents in a no stoplight town in the south where I was told that my like for tinkering was not something that I should be embracing publicly. I got to play in the garage every day with my dad. I was rebuilding engines. I was rebuilding houses. I was doing all kinds of fun things with tools. But at the end of the day, I was told that that wasn't something that little girls were supposed to like. It wasn't my parents that told me that, though. They celebrated it and never pointed out that it was a girl or a boy thing. They just let it be something that I enjoyed as a hobby. But my peers at the time made it so that I felt very out of place by liking building. And so I kind of hid that part of myself. Like many superheroes do, I had to don a disguise and I had to pretend to be the girly girl in public so that I wouldn't get made fun of all the time. I decided at that point that I was gonna just really embrace my love of reading and hide in the library a lot and study really hard because I knew that where I was at wasn't where I wanted to be forever. And so I dedicated to school, I dedicated to my sports, and I started to try to figure out how to get to college next. Because I knew that my parents couldn't help me to get there, and I knew that my hometown thought that that wasn't where any of us were supposed to go next. So I kind of fought for that future. I tell people all the time that I got a little bit lost on the way to graduation because I started out college as a history major. 
See, I had gotten a full scholarship to the U.S. Air Force Academy when I was a junior in high school. And so I turned down full rides to four other universities instead to pursue what I thought was the right path for me. And that was the military path like my family had done. Now, I had childhood asthma, and it turns out that that's not something that works well with a military career. And so I was faced my senior year about to graduate with my college no longer being in the picture. So everything I had worked for and saved for was no longer something that was on my path in front of me. So I had to learn how to adapt and I had to learn how to pivot. And I instead enrolled in my local technical school and I did a two years associates there. And again, I was like, I'm still gonna end up going that military route somehow. So I started out a history major. I was going to go into JAG after that and continue down the pathway of my family. But by the end of my freshman year, I had about six different minors because it turned out I was super bored in classes. And so I had a teacher sit me down and say, well, your math and science skills are amazing. Why aren't you going into engineering? And I looked at her and I laughed and I said, girls don't do that. And that's because the only engineer that I had ever seen was Scotty in Star Trek on television. I had never seen a female engineer on television. I had never seen a female engineer in the real world. I had never seen a male engineer in the real world, to be honest. And so for the first time ever, I had a new story put in place that I could actually start adapting into my own. I went up to NC State, go Wolfpack, and for the first time ever sat in on a material science class. I felt engaged, I felt challenged, and I was excited to see what was next. And I know a lot of people will tell you to fake it till you make it, but I'm gonna tell you, learn it until you earn it. And I looked at my college career as an investment, an investment in my future, an investment in myself, and an investment to the changes that I could bring to the world. And so I got through school, I worked so that I could pay for school and graduate debt free. And then from there, my career just kind of went in a really fun way. I, I did an um, internship at a plastics additives company where I got a patent that is now in 90% of the polypropylene market. And then I spent my first career designing and building vaccines companies. And so I actually had the joy of working on the swine flu vaccine, which was the pandemic before the pandemic we're in now. Um, and so because the facility we were designing and building wasn't finished at the time, I got to go to England and live in Liverpool while I made vaccine for six months. And it was a really great experience um, as a startup and design engineer. I got to wear lots of hats. I got to learn about how facilities are constructed and built, applying some of the learnings I had from my dad earlier in life. And then I got to actually learn how we make vaccine and how we get approved by the FDA and how clinical material is formed in the first place. I got to spend a lot of time working with the World Health Organization and CDC, and I learned a lot about virology and vaccinations overall. Now, from there, though, my career kind of took a really fun pivot, of course, because I was also learning a lot about what they call leachables and extractables. And all that is is big words to mean that things inside a bottle want to come out of it or things outside the bottle want to go into it. And so in the medical world, this is a really big deal because you don't want things to be coming out of a vaccine that you need to actually have be in it to make people safe. So I went back to the plastics additives realm, which really just means the stuff we put inside of plastic to make it either clear or make it so that you can drop it and it doesn't break or to make it so it's really colorful. Um, and I focused on that for a really long time doing additive development. And I think about 2012, I got swooped up because a company liked what I had been doing in my career. And I got the opportunity to actually launch a global division focused again on medical products and consumer product goods. And so it was a really amazing experience. I was reporting into a CEO at 28. I had accomplished my goal that I had as a senior in college to hit the C-suite before 30. But I suddenly was at this place where I could help and lift others. And I turned around and there were no one that looked like me. There were no female engineers coming in the door. So in 2015, I made the choice to come out of corporate engineering full time and to go into outreach so I could talk to amazing kids like you 
and tell you about how you can start to shape your own journey, how you can pivot the course and you can write the narrative and become that superhero you want to be. Now, I'm still an engineer. I still do consulting, but more than that, I do relief engineering all over the globe. So I was down in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. I've gone down to Bolivia and about renewable systems because one of the most important things in STEM is to find a way to use those skills to turn around and help others, to bring others up, to save the world in the way that you can with the science that you know and the team that you're building as you go along. So the one thing I will leave you with though is the reminder that at the end of the day, they can take your job, they can take your money, but they can't take your skills. So look at life as an educational platform. Learn as much as you can. Try everything at least once. If you like it, try it again. Fail, fall on your face. Get back up and celebrate the things that you learned in that moment. But keep building that tool belt of skills that you need because you know what? That man's got a utility belt for a reason. He needs every single one of those skills and tools that he's designed to be able to save the world. Tamara, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you for that comprehensive presentation. You talked about your superhero origin story. You talked about hiding your engineering interests is something I definitely can share with you there. You spoke about pivoting out of corporate and into what you really dreamed of doing and inspiring young people and the next generation of scientists and engineers, which all a bunch of stuff that we have in common for sure. So let's jump right into your questions. Let's see what our audience is asking about. It looks like we have a few people joining us again for your questions as well. So let's hear this first one from Samuel and Jacob. Hi, I'm Samuel and this is Jacob. We have a question for Cameron Robertson. What's your favorite episode of Myth Bustles Junior? What a great question. And I completely forgot to talk about my Mythbusters career. Um, so, yes, as part of my outreach, I landed in the franchise of Mythbusters, and it's been an amazing journey. Um, you know, we did Myth Mythbusters The Search, Tracy and I, and then uh, I got some time with Mythbusters 2.0 with John and Brian. And most recently, I had the joy of doing Mythbusters Junior, um, teaming back up with Adam Savage and John Marcou as makers but more importantly, getting to inspire and work side by side with Elijah, Rachel, Cannon, Ali, Valerie, and Jesse. And I have to say, I think I learned just as much from them as they learned from me. And that's something that's really cool because that mentor and mentee standpoint got switched back and forth every single day. So each day on set with Mythbusters Jr. was an absolute joy for me. My dream has always been to host a kids maker show. Um, and there were so many fun moments. You know, we got to look at how much water a dog can shake off, which filled the set with wet puppies, which sounds like it might be smelly, but it was super cuddly and fun. Um, we got to explode farts. I mean, where else do you get a light a fart on fire and not have to worry about someone yelling at you for it, right? Uh, but perhaps my favorite one was as an archer, we took on the Odyssean myth of shooting an arrow through small holes at 30 yards, and we got it on our first try. We thought we would fail a lot, but we did it, and the kids helped make that happen. <laughs> Tamara, that's such a cool answer. And yeah, Midbrook Jr. definitely co signed. It's an absolutely awesome show. Seen a lot of cool stuff go down on the show. So it looks like we have another question coming up from Kyla. Let's hear that one now. Hi, Ms. Robertson. I'm Kyla from Washington, D.C. I've read only a small percentage of women are engineers. What's your advice to girls who are interested in engineering? That's a great question. So really quickly, it looks like we've heard several students ask that question as well. And I want to give a huge shout out to Libby from Arlington, Virginia, and Grace from Maryland, who sent in the exact same question. Tamaris, Tamara, rather, sounds like a lot of girls want to know about this one from you. Yeah, so this is a really um, important, impactful item right now. You know, part of what I do is try to normalize women both on an operations floor as an engineer and in a shop on television and in my day to day life. But that percentage is really low. You know, the statistics speak for themselves. Right now, only 13% of engineers are women, only 6% of that are women of color. We make 90 cents on the dollar compared to our male peers. 
So that's 10% less. Um, in the at the end of the day, this stems from a lot of things. You know, you have kids that grew up like me, where their joy of tinkering was kind of pushed down by their peers. You know, they were told that it was a boy thing, so they might avoid it in general. In fact, you have 28% of men saying they're going to be engineers when they go into college, but only 9% of women. And of that 9% that actually go into engineering, 32% are going to switch out before they ever graduate. Now, maybe this is because only 17% of tenured teachers are female, or it could be what most women say is the reason they leave, and that's the environment that they're in. So the climate is something that is going to take a lot longer to change. You know, we're seeing really great increases from, from 2012 to 2017, 58% more women graduated with engineering BSs. And that's amazing. And the reason that they're finally able to do that is because we are all working to inspire young girls to stick with it no matter what their peers said. We're supporting the education path. We're showing them the way that they can go and we're helping them navigate these kind of hard seas. So I would say young girls reach out to each other and start to help lift one another. Find someone that looks like you, that reminds you of you and help them. Find someone that doesn't look like you or remind you of you and help them. Be the one that reaches out, help each other. You know, um, it's one of those things that I tell young girls, especially the trope of cat fighting women is alive and well in science and engineering. And only we as women can change that. Men have gotten to where they are because they get to the top, they turn around and they reach back and find someone like them. As women, I can tell you right now, I've been held back mostly by women managers. So we have got to change that. So girls lift each other up, join hands. We are in this together. We will either rise together or we will fall together. Tamara, that's awesome. Thank you for ending that on a positive note. And I mean, as someone else who kind of looked above and didn't see anyone that looked like me in science engineering, that definitely inspires and resonates with me as well. So thanks for sharing those positive words. And thank you to everyone that's been watching for these super insightful questions. That's all the time we have for questions today. But stay tuned as Tamara and Tracy will be back shortly to talk about their other things that they're working on together. And if you have another question for Tamara that we didn't cover today, Send it to us now using usascienceFestival.org, and we'll get Tamara's answers to you after the program. Everyone, please give Tamara a virtual high five and a round of applause. Tamara, that was an absolutely awesome job. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, and reach out, everyone. We're in this together. Awesome. Before we bring Tracy and Tamara together to continue our conversation, it's time for a brain break. So far, we've been learning about different careers in engineering here on Earth. What about engineering required to take us into outer space, though? Let's join NASA and scientist Stephen Grenade for a fun look at the NASA Space Launch System that will allow us to explore deep space. The thing that makes space travel difficult is that everything we use to do it is so massive. To get to orbit, let alone to the moon or Mars, you have to lift a lot of very heavy stuff. So how do you do that? How do you escape gravity, the force that holds us to Earth? Well, let's talk. <laughs> Traveling through space is hard. That's why NASA's Space Launch System will have to be the most powerful rocket in history. How is SLS able to meet the challenges of exploring deep space? Well, when it comes to our journey to Mars and beyond, there are no small steps. Let's talk about low Earth orbit first, which, compared to Mars, is relatively close. The International Space Station is only 220 miles over our heads. For years, the space shuttle got us to low Earth orbit. It weighed about 4.4 million pounds and could carry 54,000 pounds into orbit. That's only about 18 family sedans worth of stuff, and that's because of that 4.4 million pounds of weight, 3 million pounds was fuel. The shuttle's fuel weighed more than twice the shuttle, its external tank, and the solid rocket boosters combined. It's like driving a car that requires a thousand gallon gas tank. The shuttle got us to low Earth orbit, but what about the moon? Well, the moon is 240,000 miles away, which is a thousand times further than the shuttle can take us. Thankfully, we don't need a thousand times as much fuel. The cool thing about space is you can coast. We've just got to go fast enough to reach the moon and let its gravity pull us into orbit. So you don't need a thousand times as much fuel, but you do need more. 
but the more fuel you have, the heavier your vehicle has to be, and the heavier your vehicle is, the more fuel you need. Tricky, huh? The Saturn V is the rocket that took us to the moon. It could carry 260,000 pounds into orbit. That's almost five times what the space shuttle could carry, and it could carry 100,000 pounds to the moon. However, to do that, it weighed six and a half million pounds, and six million pounds of that was fuel. That's right, to get to the moon, we had to build a vehicle that was over 90% fuel. Now, what about Mars? Well, when we go to Mars, it'll be about 50 million miles away. About 200 times further away than the moon. The space shuttle won't get us there. The Saturn V won't get us there. We'd kind of like to come back. So the family sedan isn't going to get us there. We need something bigger. We need a van or a bus or maybe the biggest rocket in the history of the world. We need the SLS. The first version of SLS will get us to the moon. The second version will be the tallest rocket in history. It'll produce the greatest thrust and it'll get the most stuff into orbit. The second version of the SLS will have about the same fuel as the Saturn V. But where the Saturn V could only go to the moon, the SLS will go to Mars. Next time, we'll talk about what makes the SLS so powerful and how the space shuttle and the Saturn V paved the way to Mars. Thanks for watching. I hope you all enjoyed that break as much as I did. Thank you to NASA for that interesting look at the engineering technology that will eventually take us to Mars and beyond. If you're just tuning in, we are exploring the world of superhero science with engineering role models, Dr. Tracy Fenera and Tamara Robertson. Let's welcome these two superheroes back to the program and learn more about what they do with their powers combined. And Tamara, welcome back. Hey, 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 hey. Let's start off with some hey, fun. Everyone. It's virtual selfie time. Tracy, Tamara, are you two up for taking a little virtual selfie with the audience? Absolutely. Heck yeah. Cool. Cool. Let's do it. Everybody, grab your phone and let's get ready. Everybody get their poses ready. We're going to go ahead and smile. All right. Now, let's, let's do a count of three. All right. All right. Let's do a, we, can, we, can do, we can do a regular smile and then we'll do a kind of funky one. Okay. One. Two, three. All right, now we got to do a little bit of a funky one. All right, make a funky face, whatever it is. Maybe you have something, maybe a flaming explosive fart came in your room and, and it stinks. Maybe you make that face, whatever your reaction is. <laughs> All right, we'll do that face on the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> all right cool thank you all for participating with us on that one don't forget to share those selfies with us be sure to tag usa science fest and me at mr fascinate and use the hashtag show us how you stem tracy and, Tam and tamara i'm so excited about the secrets of science comic book that y'all have created i would love to learn more about this project and the other ways that you two collaborate all right so looks like we have a couple of questions here uh, I want to know, first and foremost, how did you choose which ideas that you would pursue in the beginning? We'll start off with you, Tracy. That's a really great question. First of all, it, Seekers of Science is awesome because it really does bring together so many different disciplines of science to solve a problem. And, and that is so important. And we've seen that science has proven that diverse teams in general are more effective. Um, but so for me, the, the where we got started was was an oil spill. That was that was issue one. Um, and at the time, I was working at Mount Marine Laboratory and, and in the Gulf of Mexico, where where we were wrapping up on the BP oil spill. And so that's kind of what what just got my mind thinking um, towards that oil spill because it really. It, that oil spill was monitored by citizen scientists for years, for decades, and well, not decades, but but for since the oil spill happened. And in fact, during the BP oil spill cleanup and citizen science or community science monitoring, they actually found another oil spill that had been happening for years, since 2004, this oil spill called the Taylor oil spill had been going on. Um, and no one really knew about it. So, so you know, thousands of gallons of oil was leaking into the Gulf of Mexico, unbeknownst to anyone for years. And, and community science or citizen science was such a huge part of that cleanup, that monitoring 
and and uh, the the detection of this o- other oil spill. And that was kind of in my head at the time that we started this comic. And so so for me, for in, in Tamara led issues uh, two and four, minor one and three. Uh, that's kind of where that went. And then and then for issue three, uh, the reason why I thought of that was because I had just visited Hawaii and helped them on a community science project to monitor a bark beetle to um, prevent from in, invasive uh, fungus that was taking over uh, a native species uh, in Hawaii called the ohia tree. But, but Tamara should definitely weigh in on this as well. Yeah, so Seekers of Science, um, as Tracy said, is, is born from the fact that no, no solution is ever silo based. You know, we're all working together and we're all trying to utilize the tech and the science that we're developing and learning about to be able to solve these solutions. So issue one, as Tracy said, kind of hit on her specialty. Issue two hit on mine with regards to we actually tackle a pandemic. We look at what the process is for finding out who patient zero is, tracing the actual virus that you're working against, and then being able to make clinical materials and then eventually a vaccine. And then again, having to go back and actually treat the people um, that have it. So when we started, we knew, okay, we need to make sure that we cover what our specialties are first so that people understand why we are the right people to be leading this comic and to be taking on these adventures. And then from there, we started building what we call our board. And those are all of the experts that we know, that we've worked with, that inspire us. And it's something where each issue, you know, we have, we've got 20 issues worth of ideas. We have 20 plus issues worth of experts that we know and love. And so we kind of looked at each one as, okay, I've recently done this. I can reach out to them right now. So like issue four is on AI. And I did that because I did a superhero science panel at North Carolina Comic Con. I worked with NC State's um, actual AI specialist and her and I sat down and we both love comics and we both love science. And so I was like, I would love to do an issue on you. So issue four covers AI and AR and VR. And it became something that was really fun because we got to uplift my alma mater. We got to uplift what she was doing. And so each issue is going to continue being like that. It's going to celebrate the people that we come across, the projects that we see changing the world, and anything also that our, um, you know, our customers send to us and say that they love, the people they want to see. You know, we're hoping it becomes an interactive community experience. Hmm. Well, thanks for that comprehensive tag team answer. It looks like you are, are as promised, superheroes. <laughs> so how do you all take an idea, right? A back of the napkin idea where you kind of want to do something and then you make it into reality. What is you all's process uh, for a collaboration that led you all to, to making this real? Let's start off with you, Tamara. So it's really interesting. Obviously, um, Tracy and I are the science editors on these comics. So we have a phenomenal writer, Todd Black, who works with us out of Chicago. And so we kind of sit down and we do a brainstorming session, just like you would do in engineering and science. We say, OK, what's the problem we want to tackle? What's some potential tech that we could use? Where could we go with this? And Todd is amazing at figuring out the adventure and the comic side of it because he's been a comic writer for a long time. And then Tracy and I will go and we'll deep dive the science and we'll bring that in. And so it builds what we call our SOS facts that are in the bottom of some of the panels that will tell you what certain abbreviations mean or what certain words mean. So you're learning the science along with the adventure. And it's something that just kind of builds from there. And sometimes our artist sends us just incredible photos that we're like, we have to figure out how to incorporate that in because the art side is so important, especially in, in a comic. Right. So, I mean, why a comic, though? What was what was the decision making process behind choosing a comic as the vehicle to, to inform people? Tracy? That's a great question. And, and honestly, um, we were both doing work with with kids and and kids really are the future they're the ones that have the biggest impact when influencing adults they're the ones that are going to be leading this country not not long from now um so so working with kids was important and i know that when i was little i wasn't big on reading and and you know like not many people know that about me i the only thing i would read was a comic book 
Um, so when Marvel Unstoppable Wasp approached Tamara and I to, to be featured in, in an issue, we were both ecstatic. I mean, to be in a Marvel comic, that's, that's amazing. And so after that, a comic writer reached out to both of us about doing our own comic and everything just came full circle. And, and that's when we took the ball and ran with it. The other thing uh, too, is that comics, comics are accessible, they're approachable, you know, there's free comic days. Um, any, any person can get a comic into their hands, whether it's digitally or in print. And then comics are naturally diverse and inclusive. So it became something where that platform really married well with what we were already doing in our outreach and what we wanted to see happen more and more in science and engineering. Gotcha. That's awesome. And you know, one of the things that I think about, uh, especially when you're creating a comic or any form of unique uh, science communication is the help that you require from experts. And so how do you all find these experts to assist you, whether it's on uh, fields that may be outside of your expertise or uh, other craftsmen like animators or, or uh, illustrators that can help you bring a project like this to life? We've been really lucky that um, in a lot of this, you know, in the beginning, the team came to us, you know, like the comic book writer reached out to us. He already had an artist he was working with. The Marvel writer that reached out to us also connected us with a lot of resources. Um, and then as far as the experts themselves, we have a deep bench, uh, not only because of our career fields, but also because of the shows that we've been a part of. And then also just Twitter and Instagram, like social media is something that's making the world smaller and smaller. And literally you can put up a post and ask for resources and people want to help, especially in the STEM community. So I would tell all the kids out there, if you guys need a help, if you need an expert, if you need a guide, throw up a post, have people share it. And I guarantee someone is going to answer, you know, the worst that they can say is no. So always ask. Very true. And, you know, and like we were saying before, these issues have been backing our actual experience. So our experts so far have been kind of on hand because it's our actual work. And, and you'll see in there that, that Tamara and I, we don't have superpowers. We, we have everything. And, and that's what we want to tell the kids, that they have everything they need right now to change the world. And, and that's why it's so important that we're actually marrying our actual experiences and, and reaching out to the experts that we did when we were actually tackling these problems. Um, so it's been, it's been pretty, pretty amazing. And it's an opportunity when we start reaching out to experts that we don't know. It's, it's a huge opportunity to just bring more people into a mission to, to spread science to as many people as possible. Yeah, and to awesome. Tracy's point, you know, we tell kids all the time, just like Batman and Tony Stark, if you use your brain and your hands and the people around you to help you, you can be a superhero too. Gotcha. Awesome. So it looks like you all have an SOS camp coming up soon. Uh, so what's that all about and what is that going to look like this summer? Tracy? So Mission Tampa, yeah. <laughs> Mission Tampa Bay is having a STEM camp. And now they've done this in the in the past. And they asked me because uh, they had me keynote a couple of their talks for the National, um, the National Science Education Leaders of America in Seller. Um, and so they came to me and they were like, hey, we need you to run this camp for us. And I was like, perfect. Tamara, <laughs> you have to help me. And we have to, we have to combine forces to elevate or use SOS as a launching pad to to have these kids uh, use multidisciplinary um, avenues or pathways to, to answer real world problems throughout a week. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. We're in the beginning phases right now, but, but it's going to be pretty awesome. I think we're, we're going to have around 40 kids uh, this summer for, for a week. So um, yeah, stay tuned to that. Awesome. Tamara, did you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, like Tracy said, it's going to be an exciting week with the kids. Um, we're going to we're going to have each day be themed after a different issue. And we're even going to throw in a fun Mythbusters day. So I think I think it's going to be a fun uh, experience 
to, to do and be there on the ground for because most of the time our, our comics end up at camps that we're not at and we're just getting to zoom into. So to be in person with some kiddos again and, and get to explore science is going to be fun. Awesome. Yeah, I wish I could attend that camp in person. Maybe I'll shrink my age down a little bit so I can be a participant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like Actually, you're that would donated be really awesome. Join in. Oh, OK. Yeah, we can make, maybe talk about <laughs> that. that. Awesome. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Uh, so you all have donated over 200,000 copies of your comic, right? And you have no plans of slowing down. So how do you all, uh, how do people get involved if they're interested in working with your team? So there's a lot of different ways. Um, you know, we just actually launched uh, via um, Amazon and Kindle. So educators all around the globe now can get at cost to print um, copies if they want to use it. We work with a lot of nonprofits here in the U.S. directly to be able to get them comics, um, as well as what we have these jelly bands. They say Seekers of Science. Uh, and then on the inside is the link that everyone um, that is attending XM will get as well. And it gives them the first two digital issues for free. Um, the bands do glow in the dark and they do surprise you when you're camping and forget that. Um, but it's something that, you know, organizations re just reach out to. You know, they can go to seekersofscience.com. Um, we have a contact us page. Let us know about the events you're doing, what you can do. We do everything from in-person to Zoom to just sending materials. Um, the more hands-on we can be, the happier we always are, of course. You know, seeing kids have those aha moments is what it makes us excited about what we do. So it looks like we have a couple more video questions coming up from the audience. So we'll hear those coming up right now. My question is, what was your favorite scientific experiment? Thank you for answering my question. What a great question. There are so many cool scientific experiments. Um, I, of course, like things that explode and burn. Um, so probably one of my favorites is working with dragon's breath, which is just a big word called lycopodium powder, which is moth pollen. Um, and what it does is it creates a really fun dust explosion and a really quick burn off fireball. So I like to use those. Um, you know, it's something that magicians use, it's something that scientists use, and it's also something that happens sometimes, sadly, in real life with giant grain silos. So understanding how those little explosions can be controlled in a fun DIY makes it so that we as design engineers can prevent it from happening in real life. Cool. Okay. Well, it looks like that was the last video question that we have coming in from our audience today. So that is awesome. And thank you for that answer. Tracy, what role models did you have that inspired you to do what you do today? That's a, <laughs> yeah. So growing up there, there weren't many STEM role models. Like, like Tamara was saying earlier, I, I mean, there was Mr. Wizard and, and Bill Nye, but, but there wasn't many female role models, if, if any at all. And so it was just um, what really inspired me was was that my parents really believed in me. Honestly, uh, at a young age, five years old, I had Coke bottle glasses and everybody assumed that I was smart. And I kind of worked to live up to that by by going in science and, and doing well in math. But but it was really my love for invention that got me started. I started winning invention conventions or science fairs every single year. And that that really inspired me on my path. Now, that's a lot different than today. Today, I have a lot of STEM role models. I mean, uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle has done amazing things. Catherine Hayhoe, who is a climate scientist, it, absolutely incredible. And of course, um, uh, Catherine Sullivan, who who <laughs> went to space and, and has dove deep into the deepest parts of our ocean was the NOAA director for a while. Like the, I, I have a lot of STEM role models now. Awesome. Yeah. And I actually, that's interesting that you bring that up. Catherine Sullivan was the deputy director of NOAA when I was an intern at NOAA. And I actually got to interview her uh, last year for something. So definitely a role model of mine as that's well. So cool. Tamara, I know you spoke, yeah. Right. <laughs> Tamara, I know you spoke about some role models. Uh, do you or you spoke a little bit about role models earlier, but did you have any people that inspired you along the path 
in the beginning? I think, you know, again, me building and doing science and stuff was something that came later. And like the, the building, I had my dad um, for sure, you know, as, as a military guy, he wasn't home very often, but when he was, we were always tinkering. Um, and then my grandpa was a train engineer. So like I got re into really big mechanical tech, like very young. Um, and I say train engineer, but you know, he, not an actual engineer, the guy that runs all the lines and does all that, which I fell in love with that switchboard as a child. Um, but I think the bigger uh, inspirations for me actually were my mom and my godmom because they were female Marines in the 80s when there wasn't a lot of them. And, you know, they're the ones that taught me that more often than not, I was going to work three times as hard as the males in my life and I was going to get half the credit that they were, but that it was worth it to keep pushing and keep going and I think it's because of their resilience and the things that I saw them have to take on and go through to be successful in their career that I was able to stick it out through, you know, an engineering degree program where we were only, you know, 12 percent and then a career field where I was the only female for multiple layers of management. I think um, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I am now. Hmm. That's awesome, Tamara. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. It looks like we have actually one last video question that's come in. So we'll cut to that one right now. Hi, Tamara. I am Marlene from Arlington, Virginia. What is it like to be a superhero scientist? What a great question. So I had never heard of a Comic-Con until I got on Mythbusters. And then I found my people, which was amazing. And I've had the opportunity through that to really embrace my superhero scientist title. Um, I joke that I'm an engineer by day and a superhero scientist by night. And it's one of those things that I get to look at the really cool tech and science that's shown in comics and connect it with real world tech that we have today and connect it where it could go from there. And it's kind of that chicken or the egg. Did the sci-fi inspire the science or did the science inspire the sci-fi? I think, you know, we saw Star Trek inspire most of what we have today from our cell phones to our touch screens to our 3D printing food technology. And then now I'm super excited because I feel like Black Panther has actually given us a whole new area of tech to try to evolve to. And you don't see that often where suddenly you get a major picture that's putting tech up that is blowing people's minds and going, how do we do that? How do we get to have like mag lev trains that are going to be that efficient? How do we get to be able to heal people that quickly? And so I think being a superhero scientist is an extremely exciting thing for me. And it's something that I hope more people will embrace because sci-fi can really just open your mind to the possibilities. Tamara, thanks for sharing that perspective. I think it's awesome. As a sci-fi nerd myself, I know that a lot of inventions like robots and cell phones and even cars that fly, which are now known as helicopters, were inspired first by sci-fi novels before they became real. So thank you again to our audience members for sharing those questions and glad you all were supportive there. Tracy and Tamara, before we say goodbye, I know the audience is gonna love to learn a little bit more about Seekers of Science, so tell us how they can learn a little bit more. Uh, they can go to seekersofscience.com or they can go to sos.comicbook on Instagram uh, and they'll get all the updates as well as a lot of fun science facts and some sneak peeks into each of the issues. Cool, cool. Well, Tracy and Tamara, I had an awesome time chatting with both of you. Thanks again for coming here and inspiring these young people, showing them that they too can be superheroes in STEM, just like you all are, and they have everything they need with them to do that. So I'll see you both again very soon. And I hope this program has inspired you all to dream big. Keep the momentum going and take the next step by visiting usasciencefestival.org slash next steps for free STEM resources for today's speakers, our partners, and more. Here you'll find a list of free resources to help guide and enhance your own STEM journey, including a free downloadable issue of Tracy and Tamara's Seeker of Science comic book. And for the educators in the audience, you'll also find materials you can use in your classroom as well. I'd like to again thank our generous partners at AstraZeneca, the U.S. Air Force, and the U.S. Department of Defense DOD STEM for supporting this XSTEM All Access program. I hope you've enjoyed today's first installment of this XSTEM All Access series. 
Don't forget to tune in at the same time tomorrow for our second episode, Exploring Our Minds, with neuroscientist Dr. K. Tai and brain engineer Dr. Kof Zaraza. If you miss any episodes, the entire series will be available on demand at no cost. Visit usasciencefestival.org for more. Mark your calendars for these upcoming programs from the USA Science and Engineering Festival. Get ready for another XSTEM All Access in September. Educators, join us in May and November for the Inspire Educators Workshop Series, hosted by world champion magician and host of Impossible Science at Home, Jason Latimer. And don't miss the SciFest Virtual Expo in October. Visit usasciencefestival.org for more information. And don't forget to show us how you STEM. Tag USA Science Fest and me, at Mr. Fascinate, and use the hashtag show us how you STEM and XSTEM. Thank you for joining us from around the globe. Each and every one of us has the ability to change the world and STEM is a part of that process. I can't wait to see what the future holds for all of you, the next generation of innovators. Thank you for joining us and I'll see you all on the next one.